Well, let's move on now to our focus report. And this Friday, we get up to speed on the situation in Libya. Under Italy's impulse, the European Union is considering taking part in military operations there, an intervention that would help shore up the brand new National Accord government. The man at the head of this very fragile UN backed coalition is Prime Minister Fayez al Sarraz, who began his mandate under a shroud of secrecy and is now facing an uphill battle to restore peace and unity in his deeply divided country. This footage has been heavily broadcasted all over Libya. The chief of the country's new UN-backed government, Fayaz al-Sarraj, returning after months spent in exile. He's the man supposed to restore peace and order in the country. I want to thank all Libyans who've helped my return. They're patriots. They must help us rebuild the country. But the prime minister-designate wasn't given a triumphant welcome. All things related to his return were first kept secret and with Libya's airspace closed and very dangerous roads vulnerable to attacks, he had no other choice but to make his way back to his country by sea. There was absolute secrecy around this operation. Thanks God it was a success. Fayaz al-Sarraj finally reached Libya aboard this simple Coast Guard speedboat on March 31st. After a journey that lasted 10 hours from Sfax in Tunisia, to Tripoli's naval base. It's a far cry from the usual comfort and formalities reserved for a head of state, but the crew members rather highlight the importance of their assignment. For the ship's crew, this was a historic mission. We were so proud to be able to serve our country by doing this to bring back the members of our government. Returning to Libya is a first step. The new prime minister's immediate job is to gain control of Tripoli. And for that, he can now count on the support of the main local militia. The Nawasi militia is in charge of securing the city's naval base, among other places. The port is protected by men in arms, ready to engage at any given moment. Ever since his return a month ago, Fayaz al Sarraj has been living in this fortress type compound. This is where he welcomes officials and diplomats from around the world. Here are the French and German foreign ministers. In their speeches and declarations, they refer to Fayaz al Sarraj as the future of Libya. Meanwhile, Libyans are living in a state of uncertainty. Just a few kilometers away from the naval base, in what used to be a military barrack, the former Prime Minister Khalifa El Khwel refuses to hand over power. You should ask the European Union, are you looking for Libyan partners? Or are you looking for a foreign partner that's suitable for you? If you're looking for Libyans, then we are the legitimate government. L'ancien gouvernement refuse de céder le pouvoir. Il y a donc une situation surréaliste avec souvent deux administrations qui coexistent. Exemple ici au ministère de l'Information. Jamal Zoubia is the head of the Foreign Press Department. He does not recognize the new coalition government and continues to manage his administration. This is the, this is the office for archiving. He's the person who issues press cards, a compulsory item for whoever wants to work in Libya as a journalist. Yes. Permits which bear the stamp of the former government. They sent me messages, but I told them, who are you? They said, um, you, are, you, are not, you should not stay here. I said, who are you? Because you have no authority. So who is officially at the head of Libya? As people are lining up in front of ATMs, banks running out of cash, it's a question no Libyan we've met seems to be able to answer. How long will the coalition government take to establish its power and become legitimate in the eyes of all Libyans? an objective which remains ever so distant. Well, for more on this, let's cross to our guest, Mathia Toaldo from the European Council on Foreign Relations and who specialises in Libyan issues. Hello, thank you very much for being with us on France 24. Um, let's perhaps begin with asking you this slightly provocative question. With hindsight, were most Libyans better off under Gaddafi's rule? 
No, we tend to forget what Gaddafi did for many years, that he supported several terrorist attacks uh, in Europe, uh, that he harbored uh, chemical weapons, and he built uh, the premises of the instability that we're living today. His divide and rule uh, split the country already before the 2011 intervention. So no, the problem was not removing Gaddafi, the problem was not handling the transition after Gaddafi. And why was it not handled? Uh, because most leaders, uh, particularly the, the French president and the British prime minister, had other priorities. So uh, even though there were some uh, Western assistance programs in the country, there was no political efforts to mediate between different uh, Libyan factions. Well, looking at the political double act we just saw there, uh, does the new government's legitimacy come solely from foreign endorsement? No, this is not true. Uh, the new government has the support of several members of parliament who have not been allowed to vote uh, in Tobruk by a violent minority. Uh, it has the support of several local councils, uh, especially in Western Libya, but also in the south of the country. It has the support of several tribal leaders. So it's not a foreign puppet as uh, its opponents try to portray it. And can the new government realistically impose itself as the only legitimate authority without a military crackdown? Does it even have the means to do so, considering the country's awash with weapons and armed factions? Probably the only way it cannot impose itself is by military means. Uh, no Libyan actor alone is capable of overcoming the others. That's why they've had a civil war for many years, which has been a quite an inconclusive one. Uh, they will have to mediate, perhaps for some time, the real rival of uh, Suraj government will not be uh, the man you interviewed, uh, Khalifa Well, who now rules over very little, but the rival government in the East who just tried uh, to sell oil this week uh, illegitimately. That's right. Who's buying this Eastern oil? Uh, well, the intermediary company is a UAE-based company. Uh, the vessel was an Indian vessel. Uh, it's been sold by uh, a parallel uh, national oil uh, corporation. This is deemed illegal by the UN, which put the ship under its blacklist. And because of Libya's oil riches, there's understandable suspicion regarding foreign intervention in the country. It's also easy to see why different factions would vie for power. Is the country's resources its Achilles heel at this point? Uh, yes. Libya is in a very dire economic crisis. Oil production is one-fifth uh, of what it used to be under Gaddafi. Uh, it has eaten up most of its uh, currency reserves. Uh, the deficit uh, to GDP ratio is at 54% this year. Just bear in mind that in Europe the limit is 3%. Uh, and there is a deep uh, humanitarian crisis in which 40% of the population is in dire need of humanitarian assistance. 60% of the hospitals are inaccessible. Just to give you an idea of how serious the economic situation is in Libya. And if oil is feeding and sustaining the division between East and West, might it not be simpler to split the country into some form of autonomous regions? Uh, no, first of all, because the lines of those autonomous regions are unclear to most Libyans. Uh, you could have different uh, front lines and different borders. Uh, also, uh, it's too simple to say Libya would be split in just three parts. Probably Libya would be split in dozens of small city-states, unable to uh, perform basic uh, government duties, because you do need to have larger bodies, for instance, to manage the oil wealth. So how much of a threat to the region, but also beyond, is this ongoing chaos in Libya? It's a big threat, first of all, to the Libyans. As I said, there is a, a relevant humanitarian crisis in the country. And it's a threat uh, to some of its neighbors, particularly Tunisia, but also uh, Libyans could say the other way around, that IS uh, in Libya is composed mostly or to a large extent by Tunisian fighters. So there is an exchange of instability between Libya and the regions in which uh, the region has a lot to fear, but also Europe has a lot to fear. Why does Europe have a lot to fear? Uh, Libya is very close to Europe. It's just uh, 250 kilometers from Lampedusa, so the EU uh, southernmost tip. Uh, it, it could harbor, and it does already harbor, uh, jihadist camps. Uh, there, it's always been a gateway for illegal migration, and it's starting to be again, uh, it's starting to see again a large flow of uh, migrants uh, to Sicily. So there are several sources of instability which are coming from Libya to Europe. Mathieu Toelou, thank you very much for having spoken to us on France 24. Thank you.